Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Leading Voices series. My name is Rich Howarth. I'm a professor in the Environmental Studies program. And it's, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome Mr. Todd Stern back to Dartmouth. Mr. Stern is a member of Dartmouth's class of 1973. Um, he went on to the Harvard Law School, but then went on to an illustrative, an illustrious career in public service. In recent years, he served as the Special Envoy for Climate Change at the State Department, where he plays a lead role in developing U.S. international policy on climate. He's President Obama's chief climate negotiator. Mr. Stern is also deeply involved in all of the processes surrounding the development of domestic climate and clean energy policy in the Obama administration. Now, going back in time, during the Clinton years, Mr. Stern served as the staff secretary at the White House, where he was a gatekeeper of sorts in relation to issues of domestic, economic, and national security policy, bringing various documents and whatnot to the president for a decision. Um, he also was put on various special assignments, and these included an assignment to deal with, the, with climate policy in the Clinton years. So from 1997 to 1999, he coordinated the Clinton administration's initiative on global climate change, acting as the senior White House negotiator of the Kyoto Protocol. Mr. Stern brings extensive experience in the private sector to his work in government. Before joining the Obama administration, he was a senior fellow at the Center for American Progress and a partner at the law firm Wilmer Hale. He's a member of the Council of Foreign Relations. Um, he's taught at the Kennedy School of Government, and he's, uh, he holds appointments at the, an appointment with the German Marshall Fund of the United States. Today, he is going to talk to us on the theme of international cooperation on climate change, the path forward, and I look forward to his presentation. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you very much. I um, appreciate the uh, introduction, and I want to say uh, what a pleasure it is for me to be back at Dartmouth, back on campus, back in Hanover. And it is particularly gratifying for me to be able to return here in a capacity that allows me to contribute at least a little bit to the vibrant intellectual give and take for which Dartmouth is so well known. So thank you for the invitation and for the chance to walk around the green a little bit and down some familiar paths and for the opportunity to spend some time with all of you. I am uh, especially glad that this Leading Voices series has decided to devote one of its sessions this year to climate change. The truth is that I think public consciousness of this issue has faded in recent years despite the ongoing drumbeat of evidence month after month, year after year, that the globe is warming and our climate is changing. Media coverage about climate change is down almost 40 percent since 2009 and public attention has diminished according to any number of recent polls. Attention to the issue has even appeared to wane in typically green Europe. I, I saw a, uh, a, on one of my various trips uh, a column in the Financial Times that started a sentence saying, with climate change off the political agenda, people aren't talking about it anymore in the way that they were. And those who are talking are uh, too often yelling, an issue that should concern us all and that is likely to undermine our well-being and disrupt the world of our children has become the latest political hot button viewed by too many in political life as a third rail they can't touch. Climate change has long been a partisan issue, but when you see a parade of conservative candidates publicly recanting the apostasy of having acknowledged at one point that global warming is real, you know you've entered wonderland. This is not healthy. We can talk past each other, close our ears, put our heads in the sand, or join the local chapter of the Flat Earth Society. But here's the thing, the atmosphere doesn't care. Its temperature will continue its implacable rise with all the consequences that that entails, unless we act to stop it. Michael Gerson, George W. Bush's trusted 
and excellent speechwriter and advisor, wrote a telling piece in the Washington Post earlier this year called Climate and the Culture War. He analyzed how the issue of climate change has reached its current toxic state and then said this, however interesting this sociology may be, it has nothing to do with the science at issue. Even if all environmentalists were socialists and secularist, sec secularists and insufferable and partisan to the core, it would not alter the reality of the Earth's temperature. And that reality has been demonstrated over and over again, most recently in the work of the Berkeley Earth's Surface Temperature Project led by Dr. Richard Muller, who began his comprehensive assessment as an avowed climate skeptic and ended it convinced by the clear evidence that global warming is happening and is caused by human activity. He actually had an interesting op-ed recounting this, uh, his experience in the New York Times just in the last few days uh, called The Conversion of a Climate Skeptic. And his conclusion is emphatically shared by the best and brightest of the global scientific community, including our own National Academy of Sciences. Whether we look at the steady increase in global temperature, the buildup of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere to the highest level in a half million years, the march of warmest ever years, nine of the 10 warmest ever have occurred since 2000, the dramatic shrinking of mountain glaciers and Arctic sea ice, the accelerating rise in sea level or the acidification of our oceans, the tale told by the evidence is consistent and it is compelling. These things matter. They warn of droughts and floods and extreme storms. They warn of shortages of food and water and national security risk. They warn of what 11 retired generals and admirals, and admirals wrote about in 2007, climate change becoming, quote, a force multiplier for instability in some of the most volatile regions of the world. And these things also warn of the catastrophic, the threat of catastrophic and nonlinear change. A power company executive was quoted in the New York Times last week uh, saying, we've got the storm of the century every year now. And it's starting to look that way. Consider, a searing heat wave struck Moscow in 2010, spawning massive wildfires, killing tens of thousands, and cutting Russia's wheat crop by 40% contributing to a sharp spike in world food prices. The 2010 floods in Pakistan were the most expensive natural disaster in Pakistani history, killing nearly 2,000 people, affecting 20 million and causing nine and a half billion dollars in damage. Heavy rains triggered floods and landslides in Colombia in 2010 and again in 2011, killing over 600 people and causing nearly seven billion dollars in damage the largest natural disaster in, in the nation's history. The Queensland's flood of 2010 and 11 in, was Australia's most expensive natural disaster with a price tag as high as $30 billion. In 2010, the second, quote, 100-year drought in five years in the Amazon led to net emissions of 5 billion tons of CO2, a stunning amount when you realize that that's roughly equivalent to a fifth of all global CO2 emissions produced that year from burning fossil fuels. In Greenland, more ice melted in 2010 than any time since the start of accurate record keeping in 1958. This year, Colorado, as you've all seen, has been ravaged by wildfires that have burned an area six times the size of Manhattan. In 2011, New Mexico, Texas, Arizona, and Minnesota all had record-breaking wildfires, and Texas lost an area to fire larger than Connecticut and Rhode Island combined. And of course, we are all aware of the, of the severe drought that is currently scorching nearly 40% of the continental United States. The largest stretch of country that dry in nearly half a century and affecting 88% of our nation's corn crop. Now scientists will tell you correctly that they cannot attribute any particular event to global warming because nature doesn't leave that kind of signal but they also say that these are exactly the kinds of events that we can predict for a warmer world. And remember, these are events that we are seeing now with temperatures up since 1900, about 1.3 degrees, compared to much, much larger increases that are predicted if we don't take strong action. In short, while there is certainly much more to understand, and there is, about climate phenomena and how they work, 
A level-headed assessment of what we know already should impel us to act with vigor and determination. Today I'm going to talk about where we stand both internationally and domestically and offer some thoughts about where we need to go in our efforts to limit climate change. I just taught a class so my voice is getting a little thin. Uh, let me begin in the international arena and I want, to make a, I want to make a preliminary point. Climate change negotiations are very difficult. They are difficult first because climate change is not a conventional environmental issue. It implicates virtually every aspect of national economies, including industry, energy, transportation, agriculture, and forests. So limits on emissions make countries nervous about economic growth and development. This is an economic issue every bit as much as an environmental issue. Negotiations are also difficult because the multilateral climate body, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, includes over 190 countries. These countries are grouped into various uh, blocks with crisscrossing agendas and priorities. There are long-standing north-south resentments that continue to rile the debate. And negotiations are governed by a consensus rule of procedure, which in effect enables any small handful of determined countries to block action. So this is inherently challenging stuff. Right now we are at an interesting juncture in light of what occurred at the negotiating session that happened in South Africa last December. A juncture from which we can look back and reflect on what we have learned over the past three years and from which we can look ahead to a revised model of international climate action. At the time President Obama took office in early 2009, which was also the time that I came uh, into my uh, position, hopes were running high around the world that a major new treaty would be concluded in December of that year in Copenhagen at the annual meeting of the so-called Conference of the Parties of the UN Framework Convention. Conference of the Parties being uh, referred to in the vernacular as the COP. And there's one of these meetings, by the way, every year, so the first one, uh, it goes back to uh, 1995 and Copenhagen was number 15 and we're heading toward number 18 in December. We believed, however, from the outset that these high hopes were built on a dubious foundation. The prevailing paradigm of climate negotiations was still that a firewall existed between developed and developing countries as they were defined in the original 1992 treaty with all specific obligations to cut emissions assigned to developed countries. This paradigm is embodied in the 1997 Kyoto Protocol and the Berlin Mandate in 1995 that gave rise to it. The U.S. never thought that this paradigm was legitimate and in 1999 we saw it as an unworkable basis for moving forward. As a matter of substance, you cannot meet the climate challenge by focusing only on developed countries when developing countries already account for some 55% of global emissions from fossil fuels and will account for 65% by 2030. Indeed, if you throw in the manufacture of cement, which is a big producer of, uh, of uh, greenhouse gases, developing countries already account for uh, something like two-thirds of emissions. You cannot build a system that treats China like Chad when China is the world's second largest economy, largest emitter, second largest historic emitter, will be twice the size of, U of the U.S. in emissions in a few years and has even caught up to the European Union in per capita emissions according to recent numbers from the Netherlands Environmental Assessment Agency. And this is, by the way, no knock or criticism on China. Their economic success is remarkable, and they have surely lifted more people out of poverty faster than any country in history. They are also determined to become the world's leading producer of renewable energy. They're doing a great deal at home. But the Chinese emission numbers do mean that if we are going to be serious about taming climate change, we need to include in any kind of international agreement that we are uh, engaged in negotiating all the major emitters, both developed and developing, accounting for some 80% of global emissions and then build out from there. Further, apart from the substance as a matter of US 
politics any agreement that, re that would require action by us and not by emerging economies would be dead in the water in the U.S. Senate. Remember that all the way back in 1997, the Senate voted 95 to nothing for the so-called Byrd-Hagel resolution declaring that the U.S. should not accept commitments to reduce greenhouse gases unless developing countries accepted such commitments as well. And that was at a time when the balance between developed and developing was, was a lot more in the, in, uh, toward developed than it is now. Securing Senate support for climate agreements is difficult under any circumstances, but unless all major countries are seen as committing to real action, it will be hopeless. Of course, actions of different countries need not be the same. Addressing climate change is never a one-size-fits-all proposition, but actions by all need to be seen as fair. With this in mind, our focus for the climate meeting in Copenhagen in 2009 was clear. First, while we supported the objective of negotiating a new legally binding agreement, we made clear that we would only consider such an agreement if it fully included at least China and the other emerging, uh, emerging economies. Second, whether the product of Copenhagen was to be a legally binding agreement or not, we thought it crucial that all major players developed and developing, agree to real action, commit to take real steps, even if that commitment was po political and moral commitment rather than a legal commitment. And third, we thought it important that everyone's implementation be subject to genuine transparency so that all countries could have confidence that others were acting as well. If you look at the major climate meetings of 2009, 10, and 11 through this lens, you will see that we accomplished quite a lot. Copenhagen is often remembered for its chaos, for the spectacle of world leaders improvising an agreement in the final hours to avoid meltdown, and for the, dash, for the dashing of overinflated expectations. But it was also important. The Copenhagen Accord included, for the first time, agreement by all major countries, developed and developing, to implement a set of listed actions and to do so with international transparency. It thus struck a blow against that firewall I alluded to. It also ushered in a new, more bottom-up structure in which countries put forward their own pledges. This structure we thought was essential for bringing in the emerging economies in a manner roughly parallel to the industrialized countries. Copenhagen also included important provisions on funding, technology, and forest, provision, uh, forest protection. Although the full conference of the parties in Copenhagen refused to formally adopt the accord owing to the hard opposition of uh, a small handful of countries, the next year's meeting in Cancun, Mexico adopted a fleshed out 30-page version of the original two-page Copenhagen accord uh, and with uh, full uh, support uh, by the parties at that time. Last December's meeting in Durban, South Africa took further steps to make the Copenhagen and Cancun agreements operational for the period up to 2020, writing guidelines for the transparency regime, outlining the structure and functions of the new Green Climate Fund, and taking steps to set up a new technology center and network. But the headline out of Durban was something else, and that was an understanding reached in another short decision, which has been dubbed the Durban Platform, to negotiate a new legal agreement by, by 2015, taking effect after 2020. For us, the pivotal features of the Durban platform that will shape the contours of any new agreement negotiated under it are that it, it, it is to be applicable to all parties, that's language right from the, from, the, uh, from the decision, and that it applies in the world of the 2020s applicable to all matters because it means that that 1990s firewall, according to which in effect obligations were applicable to some but not to all, that that firewall is finished. The 2020s, the 2020s matter because by that time we will be 30 years removed from the original 1992 division of countries, making that division with each passing year ever more anachronistic. Now, none of this means that all countries will be expected to limit emissions in the same way. Differentiation among countries, among parties, is accepted as a premise of climate diplomacy. It's built right into the original treaty. 
But in the world of the, Dur of the Durban platform, it can no longer be the differentiation of two distinct categories of countries. Rather, it will have to be the differentiation of a continuum with each country expected to act vigorously in accordance with its own evolving circumstances, capabilities, and responsibilities. Now, these initial observations about the Durban platform are only the start of the discussion. A live and active debate is just beginning about the kind of legal agreement that should take effect after 2020. For many countries, the core assumption about how to address climate change is that you negotiate a treaty with binding emission targets stringent enough to meet a stipulated global goal, in this case holding the increase in global average temperature to two degrees centigrade uh, above pre-industrial levels. Uh, and, that and that treaty in, in turn drives national action. This is a kind of unified field theory of solving climate change. You get the treaty right, the treaty dictates national, uh, national action, and the problem is solved. Now, this is entirely logical. It makes perfect sense on paper, but the trouble is it ignores the classic lesson that politics, including international politics, is the art of the possible. Nations, as a rule, do not act in ways they see as contrary to their core interests or in disregard of what a great British colleague of mine once described as their compelling constraints, whether those constraints are economic or political. If countries are told that in order to reach some stipulated global goal, they must accept targets that their own leadership sees as contrary to their core interests in growth and development, those countries are likely to say no. These basic facts of life, and they're very much a part of climate negotiations, suggest that the likelihood of all relevant countries reaching consensus on a highly prescriptive climate agreement are low. And this reality in turn argues in favor of a more flexible approach that starts with nationally derived policies. Back in 2009, Australia put forward a proposal for a so-called schedule structure. This is a lingo borrowed from the trade world in which each country would offer up its own commitments. Such a scheme could be legally binding at an international level. It could be legally binding in the sense that uh, whatever <laughs> commitments countries were putting forward were legally binding nationally in terms of their own laws and regulations. Either of those are possible. This kind of approach would have a far better chance of being broadly acceptable to all parties. But the risk of a system like this is that the policies and targets countries put forward prove to be too modest. So the question is whether a system could be structured, this kind of a system could be structured, but could be done in a way that would increase its overall ambition. For example, the system might include a six month period after countries submit uh, initial or tentative uh, offers in which other governments and experts and people from civil society could react and urge modifications. But the fundamental question of how to encourage ambition in, a, in an agreement that is at the same time broadly inclusive seems to me to be one of the fundamental challenges that we will face in designing a new system. The keys to making headway in this early conceptual phase of the new agreement is to be open to new ideas that can work in the real world and to keep our eyes on the prize of reducing emissions, not to be hung up on old orthodoxies. In addition, we have to develop an agreement that builds in the capacity for modification over time. Remember, we're talking about uh, an agreement that would be completed, an instrument that would be completed by the end of 2015, but wouldn't take effect for at least five years. No one in 2015 is going to have a full understanding of what sort of reductions will be possible that many years in advance. And moreover, unforeseen changes to the good uh, in technology, let's say in the mid-2020s, may make mitigation offers that were put forward in 2015 or even 2014 obsolete. So the new agreement should give countries flexibility to modify and update their mitigation commitments, spurring more and more aggressive action over time. 
In addition, the dynamic nature of development around the world means that expectations for individual country action can no longer be frozen or in time. The developing country of 2015 may be the top five economy of 2025. This kind of flexible, legal, uh, evolving legal agreement cannot, could not guarantee that we meet a two degree goal, but insisting on a structure that would guarantee such a goal will only lead, in my judgment, to deadlock. It is more important to start now with a regime that can get us going in the right direction and that is built in a way that, maximally, that is maximally conducive to raising ambition, spurring innovation, and building political will. Now, I want to shift gears slightly. Uh, as much as we need to make the UN climate regime work effectively and promote aggressive real-world action, we also need to, re to recognize that the UN uh, uh, body can't do everything. So we should expand the field of international engagement to include other more informal groupings, of smaller groupings of countries prepared to act in ways that can make a real difference. The point of such coalitions is not to negotiate agreements, debate the meaning of treaty clauses, or grandstand about the imagined sins of our rivals, but to act, to produce results, to get something done, and efforts like these are starting. In 2009, the countries of the G20 agreed to phase out fossil fuel subsidies. We collectively spend nearly $500 billion a year on such subsidies, with only about 15 to 20 percent of them going to the bottom 40 percent of the population in developing countries. These are largely perverse incentives, bolstering already lucrative energy sources that we need to use less of, not more. There are certainly far better ways to deploy our funds. G20 countries now need to follow through and implement what was a very good and very constructive commitment, but now they need to implement it. By the way, that was a, that was a, uh, a proposal that was driven by the United States. The Major Economies Forum on Energy and Climate is a group of 17 major developed and developing economies that we established in 2009, building on a structure created by President Bush. The MEF, as we call it, <coughs> and, and, and as we established it, has a two-track mission. First, to facilitate uh, negotiations in the uh, UN climate body, and to focus on action that this group of countries, accounting for some 80% of global emissions, can do on our own. In 2009, the MEF spawned a new coalition that's known as the Clean Energy Ministerial. It's led by energy ministers of essentially the same group of countries, a few additional ones, and focused on spurring the development of clean technologies. We think that the MEF also has real potential to drive much more, a much more aggressive agenda going forward, focused on large-scale actions, kind of like the fossil fuel subsidy pledge that this group of countries can undertake on our own. Another example. <clears throat> In February, Secretary Clinton announced a new effort, the Climate and Clean Air Coalition, committed to reducing what are called short-lived climate pollutants, such as methane, black carbon, that's basically soot, and HFCs. Together, these agents, uh, they're usually regarded as small, a small part of the problem, but if you put them all together, they account for over 30% of current global warming. They also account for millions of premature deaths and extensive crop losses. We started with six countries and have already grown to some 20. Again, we just started this in February, so we have already have uh, some 20 countries and 10 non-state partners. We have set up a sci science advisory panel and brought on other key players like the World Bank and so far have $20 million in committed funds. We are implementing scaled up real world initiatives to attack large sources of emissions such as methane from landfills and from oil and gas production, black carbon from heavy duty diesel engines and HFCs that are used in refrigeration and air conditioners. Still another example, the Global Research Alliance on Agricultural Greenhouse Gases was launched in 2009. It now includes 30 countries led by New Zealand, we're a part of it and is dedicated to reducing emissions from a sector, agriculture, that currently produces 15% of global emissions. 
these initiatives and others like them are not a substitute for multilateral action in the UNFCCC. But our mission, our fundamental mission with regard to climate change has to be to produce results on the ground. And if initiatives like these can help us get things done, then my view is more power to them. Now, after a brief drink of water. <clears throat> now I'd like to turn uh, for, for uh, the remaining time to domestic politics <clears throat> and policy which are directly and importantly related to anything that happens internationally. We know that international agreement on climate is critical because climate change is a quintessential global commons problem where countries won't act unless they have confidence that their partners and competitors are acting as well. But the real key to bringing down emissions is national action. And the action that is at the heart of the matter is the transformation of the energy base of our economies. So let's take a quick look at what the United States has done over the past three and a half years. Although large-scale legislative action was blocked in 2010, President Obama has accomplished a great deal through executive action. In the transport sector, accounting for some 35% of U.S. greenhouse gas emissions, the President has put in place historic new standards that will nearly double the fuel economy of our cars and light trucks to 54 and a half miles per gallon by 2020. Dan Becker, a longtime climate activist and director of the Safe Climate Campaign, called it, and uh, was quoted in the New York Times, calling it the single biggest step the American government has ever taken to cut greenhouse gases. And we've also introduced the first ever efficiency standards for heavy, uh, heavy duty vehicles. In the building sector, accounting for 40% of U.S. emissions, the Department of Energy is and led by our Nobel Prize winning cabinet uh, minister, Steve, Steve Chu, is leading an aggressive effort to boost the efficiency of buildings through stepped up appliance standards that will affect virtually everything that uses energy inside buildings. And this effort is making a difference already. In 2005, the Energy Information Agency projected that CO2 emissions from buildings by 2030 would increase 53% as compared to 2005. So this year, the same agency, the EIA, made a projection for this, on this, the same issue, uh, energy and buildings, over the same time period, 2005 to 2030. EIA now projects a 2.4% decrease in, in building energy in that time period, rather than a 53% increase. A part of this is attributable to slower economic growth, but only a part. Better energy efficiency is a big, big factor. In the power sector, EPA recently issued regulations for CO2, carbon, for new power plants that cannot be met using coal unless the resulting emissions are captured. So the standard way in which coal has been used in power plants can't be done anymore for newly built plants and less, and this is a possible, this is a real technology that is possible, the emissions are essentially stored, captured and stored. Boosted by major investments under the 2009 Recovery Act, the U.S. has also doubled renewable energy during the President's first term uh, from sources such as wind, solar, and geothermal. And the administration is also pursuing a multi-track R&D approach under the leadership again, of Steve Chu of the Department of Energy. And this includes, first, funding a new agency that's known as ARPA-E to support early stage research aimed at developing game-changing energy technologies. ARPA-E gets its name from being modeled on this, the famous DARPA agency, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, which is responsible for a host of innovations to include the internet, stealth technology uh, used for defense, and so forth. Second part of the three-part uh, harmony on R&D um, is uh, the creation of energy innovation hubs. These are large, mission-oriented research efforts that bring together top researchers from academia, industry, and government laboratories. The first three hubs were for energy efficient buildings, nuclear reactors, and fuels made from sunlight. The president recently proposed three new hubs for smart grid technologies, 
batteries and energy storage and critical materials. All of these things, some of them sound quite technical. They are technical, but they're very important to, uh, to the use of energy and the, and the reduction of the use of energy in this country. Third prong of the strategy on R&D, the establishment of 46 energy frontier research centers, mostly university-led teams, working on basic research to overcome technical impediments to clean energy development. This R&D effort, at the end of the day, may prove to be more important than anything else that we're doing. The best hope for really containing climate change is likely through major advancement in technology, and so government R&D is crucial. Now, there are plenty of people who walk around insisting that the only thing government should do is just get out of the way, let the private sector do everything, but our history tells a very different story. Technological step change has been aided by government engagement over and over again in our history, from railroads to the interstate highway system, aviation, telecommunications, the internet, and so forth. More recently, federal research support helped lay the groundwork for new horizontal drilling techniques that are in the midst of revolutionizing the production of natural gas and altering the U.S. energy landscape. Natural gas is not perfect, but it's half as polluting as, in terms of climate change as coal. Uh, and uh, so this is an important development. Uh, one final point. Since 2006, according to the International Energy Agency, the U.S. CO2 emissions have fallen 7.7 percent, which is the largest reduction of any country in the world in that time period. Meanwhile, the latest figures from, so the, 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 these are confusing uh, initials. <laughs> Acronyms. The, the, energy, the International Energy Agency is based in Paris, International Agency on Energy. The Energy Information Agency is a U.S. agency. It's the statistical agency for, uh, for energy. And the EIA, uh, EIA's latest figures for the four months ending in March show that U.S. emissions are 14 percent lower than in 2005. Uh, a lot of that difference between the uh, uh, what the, the international agency reported, the 7.7% uh, uh, decrease, which is uh, numbers are about a year old, and these new numbers are precisely the switching of fuel in power plants from coal to natural gas, and partly because of these new drilling techniques, which have helped drive down the price of gas. Now, there are many reasons uh, for this overall U.S. emissions decline that I'm talking about. Some relate, of course, to the broader economy. Uh, if the economy is growing slower, you burn less fuel and, and, uh, and you have lower emissions. And some of it relates to the fuel uh, uh, switching that I've just talked about. We have a fly who wants to see if he wants to say anything here. Um, but these statistics, but they, they also relate to measures that we've talked about undertaken by the Obama administration. And let me say that these are statistics that very few people around the world would have predicted probably even a year ago. In short, the president has made real progress on climate and clean energy on the strength of his executive authority. But for the action of, for action of the scale that we need to transform our economy, there is no substitute for national legislation. And this truth brings us back to the question of the political challenge of climate change in our country, because national legislation of scope and reach requires a broad base of engaged public support. Such support is not easy to come by. Climate change, by its nature, is a tough issue politically. It involves, if you stop and think about it, short-term cost for long-term benefit. Its dangers seem distant and can be crowded out by the more pressing concerns of the day. It's complicated, and the link between global warming and natural disasters often feels uncertain to people, precisely because scientists can't say that global warming caused this particular event. There can also be a sense, I think, of issue fatigue that, that can set in, born of the difficulty of making rapid progress. The natural propensity of the press to give equal time to both sides of any issue, even when the evidence lies overwhelmingly on one side, can leave people confused. And then, of course, in addition, ideological interests have worked over time and fairly successfully to make this issue, in the minds of many politicians, too hot to handle. 
What I think we need is a straight talking, straight shooting conversation that explains what's at stake in climate change and why we need action to accelerate the transformation to a clean energy economy. We can and we should make clear that there are immediate non-climate benefits to doing this, building America's competitive future since clean energy will be one of the defining in industries of the 21st century, making our air cleaner, protecting our health against conventional pollution. But we also need to make clear that the severe risks of climate change make this transformation essential if we care about sustaining our health, our prosperity, and our national security. Climate change is what makes the transformation of our energy system an engagement of necessity, not an engagement of choice. On December 12th of last year, The Economist wrote in, in its online blog that 100 years from now, this is a quote, 100 years from now, looking back, the only question that will appear important about the historical moment in which we now live is the question of whether or not we did anything to arrest climate change. I myself wouldn't go that far. We are surely dealing with other seismic issues in this historical moment that we live in. But the underlying point of the blog is on target. While potent issues of the moment will always command our attention, we must also take the long view, acting now to avoid crisis down the road. So we need to present the case, both the short-term benefits and the longer-term imperative, in a sober and persuasive way not alarmist, but not pulling punches either. The benefits of action are manifest and the costs manageable. We also need to go beyond the usual suspects to find trusted figures, including people from business and the military who can speak to a broad constituency. My own conviction is that if you had the 500 CEOs of the Fortune 500 companies in a room and you talk to them about climate change, the vast majority would recognize that this problem is real, serious, and calls for a concerted response. Exactly what that response should be is a subject, fair subject for debate, but if we can at least establish the priority of developing such a response, we will have taken an, an important step forward. Finally, we need energy, the human kind, which can be found in large supply in places like this in Dartmouth, campuses across the country, among young people whose stake in what we do now about climate change couldn't be higher. Your future is now. Paving the way for broader national and international action on climate and energy won't be easy for all the reasons that I have already outlined, but it can be done and we need to start. Once again, thank you very much for the invitation to uh, come back to wonderful Hanover and to share some thoughts. And uh, if anybody has questions, I'd be happy to take some. Thank you. I'll drink some water while you're thinking. Yes. You know, I, it, it, thank you for the question. Um, I, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the, the question was that, uh, I forget the name of the, of the organization. But. Um, the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy. The, Amer the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy ranked the U.S. ninth among nations in energy efficiency behind uh, such other countries as both the U.K. and China. And uh, basically, what did I think about that? Um, so uh, it's a good question, and I, I have to tell you that I, I, uh, I saw that headline. I have not looked at it closely. Uh, I, I, have, I, I would like to understand what the, what the metrics are that they, that they use. There is no question in any number of, uh, of other studies that I've seen that China, for example, is much less energy efficient than, uh, than many countries, including the United States. I mean, not, it's not close. Uh, 
So it may be that 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 that, that uh, study is looking at the at, at some recent rate of improvement or something. I'm not I'm not actually sure, but look, energy efficiency is highly important part of the puzzle. Uh, energy efficiency is what is uh, going on in the fuel efficiency standards that I talked about. Energy efficiency is what's going on in the appliance standards that Secretary Chu is uh, is so aggressively pushing for buildings. Uh, energy efficiency is, uh, is the thing which, at some level, costs the least because it, 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 it may indeed cost something to put in the initial investment, but usually over some period of time, and usually not you know, a vast period of time, you make back in savings what you spent up front. So um, I made sure to be driving a hybrid car um, when I uh, when I uh, came into my job, and uh, and my hybrid car costs a little bit more uh, than a non-hybrid version of the same car, but I don't know whether I get the money back in two years or three years or what it is. But I absolutely get the money back because I, you know, I drive 500 miles on a tank, so uh, I use a lot less gas. Uh, so it's very important. I don't, I can't speak to the ninth to the ranking of ninth. Uh, I think the U.S. is uh, has more to do, but is actually doing quite a bit, and the, the ranking is at, at least not consistent with some other things that I've seen. Yes? I have uh, two questions, but I'll go to the second one later, which I may not have available. Uh, I have two questions, but I'll hold the second one until later. I'll okay. just ask the first one now. Um, I, I think a number of people would agree that the UN process after a couple of decades is probably going sideways at best, and that and you mentioned two particular initiatives, the Major Economies Forum and G20. And uh, it's a bit disappointing, however, that you go to the State Department website and the last press release on the Major Economies Forum was like 2010 or something. There's been very little happening there and no information at all if something is indeed happening. And G20, I don't think, even has a website that addresses these issues, mm -hmm. and, and I'm just wondering, and that is something that you know the State Department could take a huge leadership role in. And I'm just, you know, what, what are your thoughts? Uh, well, you're telling me something that I didn't know about the uh, <laughs> about the uh, website for uh, the Major Economies Forum. That, that that's our baby, so um, so there's there's nobody else is responsible for that. Uh, I, I I would I would say. Uh, a couple things about it, and I certainly think that that we should have more information up there if it's not there. The MEF, we we started the MEF with two purposes in mind, as I think I said in my in my remarks. One is to be a forum where the major players can get together at a high level. This is, this is these are ministerial meetings, uh, 17 or 18 or 19 people sitting around a table, just can have a different kind of conversation than 190 parties at a lower level, speechifying at microphones in big UN kind of rooms. So we started it so that ideas could be tested, probed, people could talk to each other, not just make speeches, to help make progress in the negotiations, and that has absolutely happened. Um, there is never a deliverable, if you will, out of those kinds of discussions, and we, and we deliberately, from the very beginning, decided that there wouldn't be there's a, a sort of chair summary that's put out, and I don't see any reason why those shouldn't be uh, uh, made available, but, but we're not trying to produce a concrete result out of that part of it. There's the second part of our focus was to have these countries in their own right, not as part of a big, uh, large organization, focus on issues that they could work on themselves, uh, that we could work on together given that this group of countries is 80% of the total emissions. In 2009, there was a bunch of work that was done early on, the first half of the year, on various sorts of technology road mapping, if you will. Uh, the MEF met at the leaders level that year in L'Aquila in Italy. It was, it was the G20, G8, and the MEF all met together uh, in July, I think. Uh, and at that meeting, the leaders charged their energy ministers to carry forward this work that had started in the MEF. 
and that gave rise to this to the Clean Energy Ministerial, which is an ongoing group that works on all sorts of things like uh, harmonized standards for, for uh, various sorts of electrical appliances and a whole host of, of areas. Uh, in the, in the period of time between 2009 and, uh, and uh, 2010 and 11, really almost all of the MEF focus was on the negotiations. We have decided that we want to kind of get back to this other, uh, this other portion of the MEF focus. Uh, and we have started that this year in our MEF meeting in, uh, in Italy this past April. We had a, a bunch of discussion about this and, uh, and are now looking for uh, uh, you know, ideas at scale and uh, and uh, at, uh, at, of, of, of kind of consequence that we could try to get this group of countries to work on. Certainly, there are the the that the message ought to be put out more, um, but we are quite focused on doing that. Uh, G20, I can't speak to so much. Yes. Hi, thank you for coming today. Um, my question is about how constantly when we talk about the um, legally binding treaty versus the bottom-up flexible approach, um, the European countries often uh, would like to side with having a legally binding treaty. Um, how does how does their mindset differ from the American mindset in this way? Because um, I'm sure they have the same economic interests that, because uh, they're just as, or um, many of them are almost as developed as the United States is. Uh, what's the difference there? Or more developed sometimes. <laughs> um, there's a really, there, there, it's, a, it's a really, it's a very good question. Uh, you're completely on target in your, uh, in your assessment. The, you know, the question is, is, is fundamentally the difference between an EU approach, which is very much focused on a kind of top-down legally binding ag agreement, the kind of one that I was talking about in, 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 in my remarks, where you, you, you have a, a temperature goal in mind, you, you agree to targets that are lined up to that goal, and you go from there. Um, look, I think that the, uh, there is a significant difference between the EU and the US mindset. Um, uh, interestingly, not because we have a difference in our view about the importance of the problem. Uh, and sometimes differences among countries are more explainable kind of on that basis that some countries are more uh, committed to the cause and some less. I wouldn't say that's the case as between the U.S. and the, and the EU. Uh, but I think a couple of differences. One is that actually the politics are quite different. Um, you, your uh, assumption was that they must be sort of similar because we are at similar levels of development. But actually, they're quite different. Um, the, uh, the green politics, the environmental politics in Europe are very strong and very influential. So that whereas we in the United States uh, need to be uh, always mindful of what, you know, what in that art of the possible phrase, what, what is possible in, in light of a lot of resistance, uh, the kind of resistance that you saw um, defeating the uh, climate and energy legislation that was put forward in, uh, in, uh, in, in 2010, made it through the House but not the Senate. The politics of the issue in Europe tend to pull governments toward the green side. It's just, it's almost the exact opposite of the way, of the, way the politics work um, in, in, uh, in the U.S. So, so, there's, so there's part, of it is, part of it is that, but by no means only that. I think there's also just a kind of different European mindset with regard to the way to approach problems uh, and uh, uh, the kind of instinctive sense that you have a problem and negotiate a treaty. Uh, there's a, you know, I think there's probably some influence in, you know, the way they work in the European Union uh, and so forth. But it's, it is, it is a, it is a less pragmatic kind of approach, I guess I would say, than the U.S. We're not 
we're not conceptually against a legal agreement. I mean, we're really not. We are trying to be mindful of what is doable. We are very skeptical about the capacity of other major players like China, India, Brazil, so forth, to sign up for legally binding commitments. Uh, we are mindful of the extraordinary challenge of getting anything <laughs> that's in, in, in the nature of an international treaty ratified uh, in the United States. So that's, you know, we, we, we unlike any other country in the world, have a, uh, have a provision in our constitution that requires a two-thirds majority vote. So um, that's always hard. I mean, I was saying in the class that I taught uh, this afternoon, um, I was pointing out the example of the law of the sea, which has the support of industry, the support of the military, has been around since the 1980s. Uh, Secretary Clinton gave it her, you know, f full college try this year, testified uh, in the Senate, which is uh, uh, an unusual thing in a situation like this, and we still couldn't get it done. Um, you have 34 senators who have some notion of that the U.S. sovereignty or this, that, or the other thing is going to be in some sense impeded, and, and so and, and, and you, you get blockage. So, uh, so I think that we look at other countries, we look at our own kind of inherent situation, and we look at, and, and we basically ask the question, what can we do to help solve the problem? We can just keep butting heads, say it's got to be legally binding, China, you've got to do it legally binding, we won't do it unless you do it, but then they're not going to do it, and we can just keep butting heads, or we can say, okay, maybe there's another way to do this. That's what we did in Copenhagen, right? In Copenhagen, uh, which was a kind of a chaotic mess in a variety of ways, but quite important, um, we and other number of other countries focused on a different structure that wasn't legally binding, but it was quite it was quite binding nonetheless. It was sort of politically and morally binding. And all countries, including China, India, Brazil, and, and the others, agreed to take real steps. They've never done that before. Never agreed to sign up for anything internationally before. Never. All of a sudden, all the major countries said, yes, we will take the following set of actions, specific, and targets. Okay, so you say it's not binding. You know, you could also ask, so if it is binding, what's going to, I mean, in, in international relations, what's actually going to happen? Probably not going to have a big enforcement penalties and all of that. You could in theory, but it's not likely. So we look and we say, how can we get something done? You know, the kind of the American kind of character, I think, is tends to be pragmatic. If we can't do it this way, can we do it that way? And maybe that way is not as good, ideally, as the first way, but at least we can move. So. One more. One more. I'm talking too long. I'm sorry. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, in your opening remarks, you mentioned a lot of uh, interesting things that are happening uh, in regards to public support and media support towards climate change. So wh what are your thoughts on how can we overcome the fact that images and narratives drive policies, and when it comes to climate change, models and graphs from scientists are very abstract. So therefore, how can you foster this public support in an era where we're more afraid of terrorism, um, the economy going down, or other more concrete dangers that we can experience right now. How is there is the United States or is any organization, international or, or national, doing anything to bring this issue to light again? Yeah, well, that is a really important question, and uh, it's a hard question. Um, and uh, you know, it's what I was uh, talking about in my remarks: the inherent difficulty of. Of, uh, of climate change in a world where there's a lot of other things that are pressing. I, I guess I think a few things. Um, I think that we need to drive a more aggressive conversation about these issues uh, than we have. I think that uh, I, I take your point about uh, images. Uh, I actually take it and I agree with it, uh, but I think it's quite possible to, uh, you know, in the hands of the right kind of uh, communications people to make things vivid um, if the effort is put into it. Um, 
I think you also have to, to look for ways in which what we're doing that helps climate change also helps more immediate, uh, in, in more immediate ways. So there are, in essence, co-benefits. I mean, if we're trying to build a clean energy economy, that actually is going to be a very important thing for U.S. competitiveness and U.S. job creation in the 21st century. I mean, China is going whole hog. I mean, China is going to eat our lunch if we're not careful on, on, uh, on the uh, production and, and, uh, and selling of green technology. I mean, this is, you know, this problem is not going away. So the need to have cleaner energy technology is gonna be one of the biggest industries of this century. So it is a, an affirmatively good thing, and it's good right now to start to start doing things it's, uh, for, uh, that that would that would in, in improve our competitive position and make us leaders uh, in, in that way. Also, when you reduce various kinds of pollution that affect climate change, it also the, the pollution has immediate impacts. Right? If you if you're reducing the use of coal, you're also going to reduce uh, pollution that has effects on health and uh, and you know, clean air and water and so forth. So I think what you can't do, you think you can't simply only talk about climate and not talk about any of the other immediate things. What you also can't do is try to hide the climate uh, change element of it and just talk about clean energy as if there's no climate uh, uh, component because uh, then uh, there's, you, the climate at some level is the most fundamental driver. And if you're just gonna talk about clean energy and somebody's gonna say, well, you know, we don't really don't wanna do that because it costs more money or we, we create more jobs if we, if we put more into fossil fuels, you know, you, you will have lost the argument if you hide the climate rationale. So I think you've gotta do both things. But look, if I had a, if I could wave a wand, if I had an answer that could, that could solve this problem quickly, I'd be doing it right now. It is a very, it is a very challenging issue. Thank you. Thank you all very much. I enjoyed it.